able to, um, you know, ask questions of our panelists. Um, I would ask just that you please join the Zoom meeting and um, and do that. So we're gonna um, continue with our panelists here, and I'm going to let's see, we're gonna put on the the big screen here. Um, so I'm gonna ask some questions of our panelists, and um, I'd love for anybody who's in the audience um, uh, again to go ahead and and you can start putting questions in the chat. Um, Myra is gonna help. Uh, direct traffic with that. And if everyone who is in the Zoom call can um, introduce themselves, again, put your, your name, phone number, email, contact information, the name of your company, if there's anything that you want to share, and then any questions that you have, we're going to use the chat feature, and then um, I will be monitoring that as, um, as we go. Um, so I've got a couple of questions for our, our panelists. Um, Jonathan, let's start with you. As an attorney, um, when you're doing a real estate deal of any kind, what are some things that you really need to look at and what are some things that you can do to protect yourself so that whether it's a, a residential deal or a commercial deal, um, what, what, are, what are some of the things, some pitfalls, what are some things that we need to be worried about? Certainly. So uh, one of the biggest things I'd caution anybody about is making sure that you know, as long as you're not purchasing a house for you yourself to live in, if you're buying residential units or you're buying commercial property, you need to put it in the name of a business entity. Generally speaking, you use an LLC. Um, and then uh, another really important consideration, and this may seem obvious to some and not so obvious to others, but there's a longstanding law in the United States that's called the statute of frauds that requires any agreement respecting real estate be written. So you have to have a written purchase agreement or else there's really no legal recourse for you. Um, so you, you wanna have a, a business any, entity, use that entity to enter into your contract, uh, that written agreement. And then um, you always wanna make sure you get a certified, a certified survey that's certified to your business entity and then have that surveyor give you a legal legal description. Um, you want to make sure you get an environmental phase one, which Mike was talking about. I'm sure he could talk much more extensively about how important they are. But as, as a real estate attorney, I can definitely tell you they're extremely important. And when it comes down to the price, it's, it's almost always uh, a very small fractional percentage of what you're going to pay to acquire the property in the first place. So, uh, you, you know, you're looking at, um, it's, it's just a no brainer. You always want to get that, that environmental, at least phase one done. Um, <clears throat> also, you want to have title insurance. Uh, generally speaking, the seller is going to cover that, uh, but you, you want to make sure you get an insurance policy covering the title history of the property um, and review those title exceptions. And you, you generally want to have probably a professional do that. Um, when it's commercial property, um, they can get pretty extensive and you may need something called title insurance um, endorsements, which are basically extensions to coverage. Um, and you want those based on what you're gonna do with the property. Um, Fantastic. Thanks, Jay, all this is really helpful. So um, um, Jonathan has put his contact information, I believe in the chat um, here, and we will also include this um, in the um, conversation on Facebook Live uh, at the conclusion of um, this workshop. I'm actually afraid to click on my Facebook Live link because I'm afraid it's going to make double sound here. But um, um, if you're on the call, if you could please uh, find the Facebook link um, on Puente Cultural Integration and share that onto your own page so that we can expand our audience, that would be uh, really fantastic. Um, and um, feel free to reach out to me or Maida Orozco, my associate manager, um, if you need referrals to any of the people that are on our, our current panel. So um, since we're talking about uh, the legal ramifications of real estate, it makes uh, logical sense to switch over then and ask uh, Regina Sanchez, our realtor on the call, um, if she can provide any quick um uh, advice as to what are some of the things that you should be looking for when you are buying a residential property, whether it be for yourself to live or for a, um, a rental property? Uh, I would highly suggest a private inspection. 
where a home inspector will come in, inspect the home, and let you know if there are any major issues going on with the home. Um, they will let you know if uh, there are basically anything, um, every, any from A to Z. So that's the major, that's the first step. Um, the, the second major step would be to get title insurance, like Mr. Morris mentioned. So those are the two most important um, steps that any buyer should take before buying a home. 100% agree. So I am a, a huge proponent of using professionals um, to, uh, you know, hire an expert, align yourself with an expert um, when you're doing um, any kind of um, transaction. So, you know, whether you need uh, an attorney or a realtor um, or some other type of consultant um, with whatever you're doing. And, and you know, I personally, I'm a, I'm a small business coach. I'm not a realtor. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a CPA. I know a little bit about everything, right? Like I'm a generalist. And so I always consult with the experts, which is why we brought this panel together today. Um, so, and I, go ahead, please, Regina. Uh, the city inspection is also important before Absolutely. you agree to purchase. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, understanding the the um, the process of of making sure you've got a clean title and making sure that you um, you know actually will will get the property when you're done is extremely important, right? So, um, and so once you've acquired the property, um, one of the things that I highly recommend too, if you're going to make any modifications to the property in any way, shape, or form, even if it's something super super small. Um, that you reach out to an architect because a lot of times people want to do um, uh, renovations themselves, but even so, it's really important to have a conversation with a professional, an, an, uh, an architect, an engineer, uh, a licensed contractor. So Luis Antonio, um, for you, when, when somebody is purchasing a, a commercial property, um, what role do you play um, from even maybe even prior to purchase? And, and then at, at what point um, is it appropriate to hire an architect to, to support uh, the work that you're doing? Well, it's, it's important that at the beginning, you actually think about your vision and what you want to do because maybe you get a very good deal on the building, but then when you start thinking how much it's gonna cost to remodel or do anything, then things really get very tricky. So uh, an initial consultation before purchasing, just a visit or a walkthrough, just to go over and see what, what you can do because there's things on zoning that probably the use that you have, you probably cannot do, and then you need to go through rezoning and, so there's many things that you need to be careful uh, after you purchase that you're going to have to comply with. Fantastic. That's great advice. That's great advice. And I don't think a lot of people think about that on the onset. And it's, I've been on, a, you know, probably a dozen walkthroughs uh, with you and, and your associates um, with clients that are looking to purchase commercial property. And it's really eye-opening to be able to, to walk through a property with an architect. They can see things that you wouldn't normally see, and they can help you judge whether or not that the, the deal is a good deal, right? And so bringing in either an architect or a, um, or a licensed uh, builder is, I think, extremely valuable. Most of the time, I recommend to my clients that we do both. And so when I've helped um, seek out commercial property for clients, that's something that we've done from the get-go. So we've brought in the architect and brought in the builder from day one, just even when we're going, um, you know, building hunting and we're looking at the initial property. So I think that's an extremely important piece of, of what, you, what you do. Um, so, um, Jermaine, from the city's standpoint, what is something that people really need to look out for in terms of just permitting and licensing and things like that when you're looking at a property um, that you're either going to turn into a rental property, a, a, a you know, a residential home that you're going to purchase for a rental property, or if you're going to be purchasing a commercial building, what are some of the things that they need to be, um, you know, kind of get a heads up about in terms of the city of Detroit? Sure, sure. Um, I, I think the way that you've you've kind of set this this conversation up this afternoon is is the way that I would approach it. Um, I think having a, having an attorney, having someone who can look or assist you with the design considerations that you might not 
look at, um, you know, from, from your knowledge of just purchasing a property, it's, it's all important, especially the environmental side of things when you're, when you're purchasing a commercial building. If you don't do that kind of due diligence, you can put yourself in a really bad situation. And we've seen it quite a bit at the city. Um, so one of the things that I would just recommend is that as you approach the city of Detroit um, for support of your project or to get permitting, there's actually a team at the city of Detroit called the Public-Private Partnership Team. Um, and the Public-Private Partnership Team consists of directors of regions and their staff who it's their job to kind of help you navigate the permitting process um, with the city of Detroit, whether it's going to uh, you know, the planning department and pulling them in for their, their consideration, BC, uh, which is the building and safety uh, office within the, with, at Detroit, who's responsible for, you know, really helping you decide what kind of permitting you need for your project. Um, and so that public-private partnership team is where I would begin um, with, uh, you know, approaching if you do have a commercial project, um, if you are looking to do a sizable investment from a residential side, say you have a number of properties within a, a particular area. Um, and then the other key piece of it that often gets lost is who are your underground community partners? Who have you, who have you talked to in, your, in the neighborhood where you're looking to do a project? Have you had conversation with them to see what's happening within the block that you could utilize or partner with to kind of leverage your project, whatever that may be? Um, and so that's, those are the things that we would encourage and we would like to see when you're bringing a project to the city of Detroit. Fantastic. Um, could you put the contact information for the, the private public um, partnership into the chat? And we'll share that to our Facebook at the, um, at the end of this as well. Um, all right. And so, um, you know, last but not least, I'd like to um, allow Angel Estra to share a little bit about um, the, this really innovative idea that, that he and his uh, co-founder came up with and, and allow him to tell a little bit about his, um, his business model and the success that they've had. So on hey guys, <clears throat> can you guys hear me? We can. Sorry about my video. Uh, I'm in Mexico and my bandwidth is very limited. So I'll stick to just, uh, uh the audio for now. But uh, yes, uh, just a little bit about my company. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, we started right when the pandemic uh, hit. So we, we didn't know if this was going to work or not. And uh, hope in um, great for us uh, is being working great. Uh, we've been scaling uh, too fast, I will say. Uh, we started with one property right in, in March. And now we're a year and, and a month later, uh, 30, 30 units. And uh, we're working on, on um, closing uh, 10 more properties by the uh, mid-May. Uh, um, so it's it's been a uh, great passive income. Well, I wouldn't call it passive. I was going to say, you're working pretty hard. I don't know that it's completely Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can, can exactly. you actually start at the beginning for us, Angel, and talk to us about how you, what, what did you do to get started? What's, what is the actual concept? Because I don't think we've fully explained that yet. Correct. So the uh, actual concept is pretty much uh, uh, um, you you provide to your customers. Uh, oh shoot! He's 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 got he's got a difficult connection. And he'll be lost you. A short term rental. It's like going to hell, but instead, <laughs> in <clears throat> can you hear me? We can now. Yeah. Would you mind repeating the last two sentences? Yes, of course. Uh, what I was saying, the, the short-term rentals and arbitration, it's pretty much like booking an hotel, but instead of uh, an hotel, you're booking a whole house, a whole room. So you can take advantage of that. Um, in, for example, if you have, if you own a home um, and you have a renter that you you don't want to struggle anymore, right? And you don't want to be dealing with uh, uh, them uh, not paying you rent on time or are not worrying about your uh, our rent, your uh, renter, uh, not uh, you know taking care of the property, uh, less wear and tear, right? So um, one of the ways to you can avoid that and actually maximize your profits is by using uh, the short term rental and arbitrage um, uh, business model. In this case, I exp I uh, use Airbnb as a tool since it's the most. Uh, uh, since they already done pretty much all the marketing for you. Mm -hmm. So if you want to market your property, it's pretty much, uh, it's easy, right? It, it's not uh, straight as forward as you think. Uh, there are some things that you got to do, of course. But like I said, uh, if you compare 
your regular your regular uh, rent um, from a, from one of your tenants. I mean, uh, you're pretty much uh, having it in a you're pretty much getting a, between two hundred to five hundred dollars each month from from a regular tenant, right? Now with Airbnb, you can double that, or even triple that. So that's one of the ba- one of the, one of the amazing things about Airbnb using Airbnb. As you didn't purchase these homes, right? Like these are not homes that you bought and are flipping as rentals, right? What? How did you acquire these properties? Correct. So this is um, this is this I, is I, where it's unique. Everyone everyone knows about the concept of flipping up a, a property or or purchasing a property and turning it into a rental. But you've done something really unique with these long term leases. So can you explain a little bit about how you figured that out? Correct. Uh, this is called the arbitrage uh, method. Pretty much, you, you look for a for a house that you think it will be a good asset for Airbnb. You talk to the uh, landlord and um, and make sure make sure you they are aware of that you what you're trying to do uh, because um, it will be very you will get any legal problems if you don't tell the landlord that you're not going to do Airbnb to it. So and then once you negotiate the deal. Uh, one thing that I was able to do is negotiate the deal for two, three years because we want to uh, rent long term, right? So, in in the other uh, good thing about doing an arbitration model is that we take care of the property, right? We have our own maintenance, we have our own housekeeping. So the landlords they're pretty much getting their their paychecks every month, and they don't even have to lift a finger. Um, so that's one of the ways to to do it. And actually, for me, is one of Oh shoot, lost you again. All right, we're yeah, Anhel, we lost you again. So the the joys of being binational and and sometimes the not best always kind of came into in the last year yeah. and you're still growing. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in learning more about um, Anhel's business model. Um, um, it is AJ Home Sharing, um, and he, I'm sure, would be willing to to chat with other people about it. So the basic, just overall summary of that is that they do long term leases um, at a negotiated rate with the with the property owner, and um, and then he is flipping the rental itself and and renting it out as an Airbnb with their permission as part of their um, um, their lease agreement. Um, and is, you know, providing all of the, um, the services that Airbnbs um, do. So um, Rob Walsh had a question for Angel specifically about, um, you know, the city of Detroit. So currently Angel is working in Austin, Texas with this model. And it's something that um, he and I've been talking about bringing to Michigan, maybe the city of Detroit, but we're not really sure about how the uh-huh. city is, is managing Airbnb right now. There's still a lot of things uh-huh. up in the air. So go ahead, Angel. We can hear you again. Uh, so actually, uh, now funny that you mentioned, I'm actually uh, coaching um, um, a, a business um, that they have uh, a multifamily uh, property with uh, 10 plus units. So I'm, I'm helping them out to set all of them as an Airbnb. Uh, he started with uh, four four units out of the uh, 10 that he has. And I and because of our strategy that we share with him, uh, he's been able to uh, have uh, pretty much uh, 95% occupancy rate. So Fantastic. he does it. And is yep, he in he the does. city of Detroit or is he in, here in Michigan? He is here in the city of Detroit. Okay. So um, Jermaine just put a, a note in the chat though, that the, the city of Detroit is still working on policies regarding um, short-term Correct. rentals with Airbnb. So I would just caution those of you who do have properties in the city um, before you decide to use this as your sole business model. Um, you do need to make sure that you've uh, registered that as a rental property for with the city. Um, Jermaine, which department um, do you um, uh, register that with? They would for, for something like this. You would need to to speak with BC. BC. Um, yeah, BC, because you know it, it, it's it's kind of uh, an issue with if it if it is going to be a rental. Um, you know, there may be some other considerations like the lead ordinance that, you know, right. a lot of rental property owners have to follow. There may, may be some other requirements and BC could help you navigate that. That's Fantastic. the building safety Correct. and engineering department. Fantastic. Would you mind putting that um, link in the chat as well, please? Sure. Um, 
So um, I think we've spoken to all of our panelists with their first kind of their initial question. And so now I really want to open it up to the audience. So Maida, you already put a couple of um, um, questions in the chat. I'd love for you to direct those to whomever um, you think could best answer those for you. Um, so I thought AJ home sharing would be the one that would answer that for you. Maybe he is. Maybe. Yeah, go ahead and go ahead and answer your question. So we are paying this home off as a land contract and we would like to buy a new home, but we want this one to become a rental property so that it can pay itself. And that way we can just focus on paying the mortgage in the new home. So what would be the process of doing that? Um, I actually think the person to answer that might be Jonathan Morris. So Jonathan, how do you turn your current home where you live into a rental property? What do you, what do you need to do? That's like actually a really interesting question, Mary, because most time people buy a property to be a rental, but if you own it currently, and then you're going to, you know, turn it into a rental once you purchase your next home, how do you, how do you go about that process? Certainly. So the first thing you probably want to do is look at any applicable local zoning, zoning ordinances to make sure that maybe the HOA or the, the township, the municipality, wherever you may be, uh, they, they may not want a rental property there. So you want to make sure you're going to be operating within the confines of the law. Second, I would highly recommend, like I discussed earlier, you're going to want to transfer title of that property into a, an LLC, generally speaking, or some kind of business entity. Because if you don't, you're really exposing all of your personal assets, everything you own, um, to, to potential liability involved with that rental property. Uh, so you want to, people talk about isolating assets, you want to isolate it by itself in that company. And that way, you know, your savings, your car, your other property, or properties they're not exposed uh, and then you always want to use a lease agreement like i said earlier about the statute of frauds you you need to have uh, a written agreement in place because we're talking about real estate here real property um so you you definitely want to have a, a, a lease in place a residential lease um so those those would be you know the, the big ticket items so and that's something that you could actually help Myra do, right? So when, when she and her fiance decide to purchase their next home, they could come to you and you could help them set up the, the whole process and what they need to know um, in terms of get, getting them a, a lease agreement that they're you know happy with. So that's one option, Myra. Then the second option would be if Lincoln Park, which I believe is where your home is, allows for Airbnbs in that neighborhood, the other option would be instead of doing a long-term lease where you would lease it for six months or a year or two years to another family, you could lease it short-term, which is going to require a lot more effort on your part, but could probably generate even more income than what you would get. Um, and it's and it's more guaranteed income in one sense because they pay you, people pay you up front. But if it doesn't rent, then you've got that empty home that you have to maintain. So there's a there's a plus side and a downside to that whole Airbnb concept. Um, but I will tell you the the friends that I have that Airbnb um, really loved it at first, and some of them then afterwards decide to reconvert the the home back to a full time uh, rental just because they it, once they find a trustworthy tenant. Um, then you don't have to do anything, right? Like you don't have to keep it clean. You don't have to maintain the, the outside. The tenants are supposed to take care of those things. So those are the things that you have to think about, right? It also depends probably the area because I'm in you know a typical neighborhood in Lincoln Park, which probably someone that's going on vacation is not going to rent. You'd actually be really surprised. One of my friends okay. who, who does Airbnb exclusively, this is how he's been uh, generating I, for the last Can day. I jump here real quick? Yeah, please go ahead on him. Um, to, honestly, to do Airbnb, you don't need to be in a vacation spot. Um, the, um, there is a lot of opportunities out there that people are not seeing. Um, check around your area if you're close to a uh, hospital, uh, college, uh, corporate, you know? Uh, when the pandemic just started, um, at the house that we just got there, they were super close to one of the medical centers and we were able to fill pretty much for months only through uh, travel nurses. So don't, don't, do not, um, uh, you know, do not think only of, as a vacation spot, think about other, other aspects, right? And, and if you have an hotel nearby and then if that hotel 
it's having bookings, then you know you can have a potential Airbnb nearby. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I know my husband is, you know, automotive and they travel a lot for, for work. And a lot of his colleagues who go and, um, you know, are, are camped out in a different city for more than, you know, five or six days, they'll get an Airbnb instead of a hotel room because they'd rather have the full kitchen and you can frequently get an Airbnb cheaper than you can pay for the hotel. And so, um, you know, people who can get a per diem as opposed to a reimbursed expense, um, where they can spend, you know, up to $150 a day or up to, you know, $200 a day, they'd much rather rent a room or a home for $80 or $90 a day, and then they can pocket that money. So it, there is a, an advantage. And with the automotive industry, you'd be surprised how many um, automotive um, engineers are traveling for work for months at a time on projects coming here to Detroit in the Detroit area. And since you're just outside of the city, you might be really, really surprised about how many people would find um, Lincoln Park an attractive place to, to Airbnb. So um, fantastic questions um, so far. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of other questions in the chat and I do apologize. I haven't been monitoring it since I've been um, um, kind of playing moderator here, but um, I'd like to open it up to anybody um, in their audience who would like to either put their question in the chat or if you'd like to unmute yourself and uh, direct a question specifically to anyone in our panel. So we're trying to, I'll continue to ask questions if, if we don't have um, group participation, but all right, we've got uh, a question from Gloria. All right, so let's see here. Is there any first time home buyer grants? Um, Gloria, that's an excellent question. I am not aware firsthand other than I know that Bank of America, um, and I actually had intended to invite some of our bankers onto the call and it, it kind of got past me, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, Bank of America does have a program where they will finance um, the closing costs for first time home buyers. So um, that is a program that I was I learned about probably a year and a half or two years ago. Um, I have not followed up, but I do have a, a direct contact with um, one of the um, home mortgage lenders at uh, Bank of America that I could put you in touch with. Um, and I, I do believe that that program is still available. So uh, we can we can look into that. So if you want to if you want to shoot me out an email. Um, or Myra, if you want to shoot me an email real quick and remind me to follow up with, with Gloria about that and do the um, introduction. Rob, do you remember um, what that banker's name was from Bank of America? She participated in the, the big HCA event that we did back in November when, when we had Bank of America sponsor. I'm trying to remember what her name was. I'll, I'll, have to, I'll look through my Rolodex and I'm sure I can find her. Um, so Rob, you have a question. Go ahead and, and, and uh, ask Jermaine directly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it has to do with, um, in particular, if a business had an eye on either a building or vacant property that was owned by the city of Detroit or the land bank, you know, I know those can be long drawn out processes, but maybe you can give us kind of a, just, just a quick overview of the difference between the two entities. Thanks. Yeah. That's a fantastic question. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Robert. Um, so so if you are interested in, in property with the city of Detroit, um, again, that, that public private partnership team will be able to assist you, but also the Detroit Bi uh, Building Authority. Um, there are realtors who are who work on behalf of the city um, to sell properties. And I'm going to include a link to the site where we have our properties listed um, that are being offered by the city of Detroit. And those are typically commercial buildings. Um, that the city of Detroit holds. Now on the land bank side, those are typically uh, uh, single family dwellings or, or two family flats. Those are more residential structures. And they also have an application process that you would need to go through um, to be considered. But then they also have, um, as many of you know, they, they, they have a number of, of events throughout the city um, where they auction off properties. They have the, the Buy It Now program and other programs that they offer uh, like they, a what's called the rehab and ready program where maybe they've rehabbed it and then sell it uh, to, to someone who's interested in the property. Um, they've been doing that across the city for some time now and actually have been doing a really great job with that program. So what I'll do is I'll include in, a, in, in the chat a link to the application and uh, property search site for the land bank. And then I'll also do the same for the city of Detroit's uh, properties that we have available as well. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. I think there's a lot of misconception about what is the land bank and what is like owned by the city of Detroit. I think a lot of times people think that that's one in the same and I know that it's, it's not. So just, just to clarify that, I think that's an important, um, you know, an important piece, um, that we have. So um, I've noticed that we've got some contractors on the call and I know um, uh, Jonathan Hyde and Corey McIntosh, who are um, two of my long-term clients, um, have done a lot with commercial properties um, and uh, residential um, properties that they, they've turned into rentals. Um, and I'm curious if they would like to share any of their experiences um, both positive and, and frustrating um, in the process of that. I know knowing them, they're probably um, working uh, still out in the field and in, in and or sitting in their trucks. But um, if either um, if either of you would like to share any of your experiences, I, we would love to hear um, some of your, your expertise. So either Jonathan Hyde or Corey McIntosh, if you guys are available to, to unmute. Hey, yeah. How are you, huh, Jonathan? Good. Um, is this... When you're looking at like commercial or residential properties, you really want that contractor or that architect or both to come through because they're, especially buying from the Detroit Land Bank, you can be walking into almost a nightmare. Um, like one house I bought, I had to spend $25,000 just to redo the foundation to the basement walls. I had to straighten out basement walls, dig around, redo the drain tiles, waterproof the outside, and the houses in the neighborhood only go for 80,000. So 25,000 of that budget was already ate up by just foundation work. So people that are not in construction definitely want somebody to go through with them so they know exactly what they're getting into before they walk into a money pit. Yeah, that's fantastic advice, Jonathan. And you know, I, I can't reiterate that enough that before you purchase a property, always bring in experts with you, you know, make sure that you've got, you know, uh, either a, a general contractor and or an architect, so it, bring in an architect for sure. If you know, you're going to want to make some changes, um, they're going to be able to let you know, you know, a, a real general uh, cost if, if that's um, the case, but the, the, you know, bringing in a general contractor with you anytime you go to look at a property um, is extremely important. And then reiterating what Regina said, you know, if it's uh, to, to have a home inspection, um, it, it costs a little bit of money, but it's so worth it. Um, you know, you can avoid so many pitfalls because they'll get up on the roof and make sure that you're not dealing with, you know, structural issues. They'll look down in the basement, look, make sure that you don't have any water damage. A lot of that stuff can be disguised with paint, but a trained eye will be able to recognize that immediately and be able to forewarn you. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't buy a property that needs some work, but understanding what that work is, is extremely important, especially if you're dealing with something that looks too good to be true, right? If it's, if it's a, a, a low um, price point for you. Um, and so, and then, you know, that being said, you know, on Hill's model of, of flipping rentals, is, is another way to get in and start doing this kind of work without having to put forth a huge capital investment, without having to do any kind of capital improvements um, on the property. So I think all of these um, concepts are, are really huge. So um, Jonathan, I, I'm not, I haven't been monitoring the chat, but if you uh, want to make sure that you put all of your contact information in there, Jonathan and his wife um, have um, multiple businesses and we've got two general contractors who are on the call both Corey McIntosh and Jonathan Hyde are clients of ours and so if you need their contact information to go with you to look at a property um, don't don't hesitate to um, to ask um, Jermaine what were you going to say yeah sorry sorry to interrupt but I just wanted all, to, add a, uh, to add a point to to the last comment that was made I, I also think it's important um, and why I think it's great that you have uh, a, a lawyer on here uh, who can assist folks is that you also want to make sure who where the title uh is and yes. how clean that title is for the property that you're purchasing uh, because i've seen it time and time again uh where folks will, will purchase a property and find out uh that maybe they don't completely own it um, right. and uh, because the title the title work may not have been up to date or may not be proper so right, there I could would be a, lean, a lien on the property from a water right. bill and we've run into that time and time again where things. people have you know uh done a land contract deal with a handshake 
Um, and then, you know, 10 years down the road, they find out that there's, you know, a 25 or $30,000 lien on the property right. from a previous mortgage or a previous water bill that didn't get paid. And it, sometimes it can go back two or three owners um, and you don't actually own your property anymore. Right. And so I think that that's really important to do a title search. I mean, it's not that hard to do, by the way. My dad's a real estate broker. And every time one of my clients um, was looking at a property, I would have him um, pull title for me. And so, um, you know, that's the advantage of, of having that in the family, but it's, it's not that hard. There's a database, you know, any, any realtor, any attorney, um, anybody from the city should be able to do a, a quick title search. So it's a really, um, sometimes it's a, it's a, there's a no cost to, to making sure that that title is clean. And so it's really important that that be a part of the process. If you're, if you're new to, to real estate acquisition, um, you know, taking a look at that title is really important. Um, Rob, it looked like you had a, a question for Renard Richard Richmond, and he has not um, come on camera yet, but Renard, do you mind if we, uh, we integrate you into the conversation? I'm not sure if you're available to be on, on camera or to, to unmute yourself. He might just be listening in. Yeah. All right. Well, so we can ask the same question of Jermaine if Renard isn't available to, to respond. So um, Rob has a great question about, um, you know, what is the city of Detroit's commitment to working with Detroit-based, um, minority-based and women-owned businesses um, uh, to be able to do some of the work that, that the city is doing. So I think, you know, we've had lots of conversations about that, Jermaine as well. So I know that you're, you're well um, versed in this exact same question, even though that's kind of, it's kind of Renard's job, but it used to be your job. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, and it's still something that's extremely important to the work that we're doing in, in planning um, and the work that we've been doing in, in the uh, housing revitalization space as well. And Renard has been a, a great partner in, in a lot of that work through his, his position in Creo. Um, and so the, the thing that I will say is that as you, some of you may be aware, uh, when there are large projects that come to the city, you really have had a champion in the, in the administration, um, but you've also had a champion with city council and saying like, look, we want to ensure that Detroiters get access to the jobs that are coming to the city. And I know uh, through our procurement space that they have a goal of 51% of, of uh, in any type of agreement that we have with a, a company that's gonna be doing business here that we wanna ensure that Detroiters get that opportunity for the job. And in regards to, uh, to, to minority and women owned business, that, that has been a, an extreme priority for us, especially within the last year, knowing that businesses have been struggling. And so we've been dedicated in a way to, to one, to ensure that they have access to funds, to lending uh, that could help them keep their doors open. And then two, as we move into hopefully a, a, a summer of, of construction and building, um, that that we are we are often looking for partners to join us in this this contracting space. As Bridget and and, and Robert can attest to, um, we've we've been very deliberate and intentional about reaching out to groups and organizations to participate in funding that we have available, like the LED program, um, where we receive roughly about thirteen million dollars. A lot of that work was is is going to be done in Southwest Detroit, and so we went out and we said, hey, who? What, what contractors in this area would be interested in becoming certified uh, in, in abating lead? And so we, we were able to kind of start a program and, and that's been successful and folks have been involved in that. And that's something that we're seeking to do not only in Southwest, but across the city of Detroit of ensuring that our programs are, are being supported and, and run by uh, thriving companies that are a part of the neighborhood. So um, I don't know if Renard wants to jump in, if he has the opportunity to on anything else, um, but that, that's a goal of ours in every project that we bring to the table. And so if um, you're a contractor and you're listening to this on Facebook Live, or maybe you're look, listening to this at, a, at after the fact, we're going to upload this to YouTube as well, and it, it's going to get shared again. Um, so if you're not live listening to us, but you're hearing about this later, um, feel free to reach out to us directly. Um, again, our my business number is 248-919-8440. You can email us at team at puenteci.com. That's P-U-E-N-T-I, the letter C, the letter I.com. Um, and you can get this information and we can uh, introduce you directly to any of these panelists and um, anybody that, um, you know, might be able to help you and support this. So I'm looking to see if there's any other questions in the chat. 
I think I'm going to go off the Facebook Live uh, momentarily here, and we're going to just do some virtual networking. So unless um, somebody else uh, on our Zoom has any questions, Amira, would you do me a favor and take a look at the Facebook Live and see if there's any comments or questions in that that we could maybe address before we um, turn off of Facebook. So um, I just like really like to thank again our sponsor. Um, with Sherwin Williams. Um, Andy, thank you so much for, for all of your support and your partnership um, over the last couple of years with the, the programs that we've been running. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their expertise um, and for their time. And um, we certainly are gonna, um, I'm gonna give everybody some additional time um, in a little more informal way. We're gonna, we're gonna go off of the recording and go off of Facebook. Um, in just a moment here, but I just wanted to thank everyone. Um, and so those of you who are still on the Zoom call, feel free to stay on and we're gonna do some virtual networking. Um, if you are watching us on Facebook Live and you'd like to join in on the conversation, you can um, jump on that, that bit.ly link. Um, it is uh, bit.ly forward slash Zoom PCI, um, all lowercase letters. Um, and you can jump right into the Zoom call and, and continue this conversation. But we really appreciate everybody um, coming on today. And um, with that, we're going to end our uh, Facebook Live and our recording. And we'll continue off, off live <laughs> um, with just some virtual networking. Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you for tuning in.